Hi, everybody. My name is Danica Joan, and welcome to Custody Matters Live. This is a special edition because, uh, of course, all of the uh, coronavirus uh, conversations, the isolation, and everything like that, um, this is something that we're going to address. And I have a very special guest with me, and we're going to talk about this. I have Dr. Mark Roseman. Welcome. Hello, everybody. Hi, Danica. Thank you for having me. Yeah, this is, this is an interesting time that we live in because there's been so much focus on coronavirus, and I don't want to just continue to focus more and more about it, but it's definitely impacted our conference. Our conference that we're having April 24th and 25th um, has create, we, we have recreated it or creatively adjusted to the circumstances um, so that, you know, the most important thing that our speakers and our whole planning team have is, you know, we're a stand that families that of equal shared parenting and making sure that children have a loving relationship with both parents. And that's what we're stand for. So of course, it's not an option to just eliminate this conference. It is not a, a conference about widgets. This is a conference about lives and the future of children and their parents. So um, I've got Dr. Mark Roseman, and I'm going to have him share a little bit about what he's going to be talking about. But before that, I'm sure you're all curious, what is the newly created uh, um, conference going to look like? So uh, surprisingly, we're going to have it as a virtual conference. It's going to look like we're going to have, I, I've got to really, I've got about a month to put this all together but we're gonna have each of the speakers deliver their content uh, just in the same structure as the conference was designed April the 24th uh, from eight to five. And then on Saturday, April the 25th, we were going to do a panel discussion at the auditorium in Lakeland, Florida, but now we're actually gonna get on Zoom, on a private Zoom meeting uh, for those who are attending and have conversations with the, all of the, the experts and stuff like that. So I'm pretty excited about uh, how we're able to shift it. And one more thing is we're not giving up on our live and in-person conference. We're actually going to move it to November. We're looking at some dates in November. So uh, if you choose to participate in the conference, you get uh, to come to the in-person, I mean, the, the online one in April, April 24th and 25th, and you also get to attend our November conference. So it's actually like a two for one. So um, talk about making lemon, lemonade out of lemons. That's, um, that's our attempt because um, we are unstoppable for the cause of children. All right, Mark, do you like to contribute? Um, shall I send you a blank check? I'm just so thrilled that you're actually one, my guest on the show and I get to announce this because it has been a struggle. It really has been a struggle with the planning team trying to figure out, well, where do we go now? Where do we navigate uh, to here and there? Do we cancel it? Do we wait? Then, you know, with the possibility of canceling it. And we just decided um, in person's not going to happen now. But we're not going to withhold information because families' lives are in the balance. I, I think this whole effort and process, Danica, has really reflected um, you as, as I've known you nearly 10 years. And that is. Uh, you know, the, the dedication to really making right from wrong. And you, you know, you said, you know, making lemonade from lemons. And, uh, and I think that that's a mission that, that as, as parents, uh, we, we, we strive for as individuals in our personal life, our, uh, you know, our, uh, our goals uh, are really to, to, to sustain and persevere. And it's so hard, and it's increasingly difficult with major national 
social change. But I think what you've done with this conference has been very, uh, uh, it has been, has been unique because the, 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 the time requires a unique response, but also giving added value, which everyone should really, uh, and I, I think find very, uh, very valuable because the, uh, the ability to have access still to those with very important uh, messages relating to co-parenting, shared parenting, and uh, family court and parental alienation and, and, and having perspective of life today uh, within now the set of challenges that, that present us uh, both from the, uh, the health and public policy uh, status and the political changes. Uh, and, and, and so it, 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 I, I think more than ever, uh, it's increasingly important that we have as much information as regularly as we can and having two conferences for the price of one is really a, 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 a very special fallout that this coronavirus uh, threat has, uh, you know, has brought. And your determination to con maintain connection with those who can most benefit uh, from all of the uh, of these very important speakers uh, and presentations uh, to later in the fall, having a much more personal uh, opportunity to become even more focused on potential answers and potential changes in the way that we live, in the way that we relate with our children, the way that policyholders will uh, adapt to uh, social change, I think is really critical. So I think that uh, this is this really is making lemonade from lemons. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, you know, <clears throat> it is. It's going to be. It's the next few weeks are going to be a challenge because we're asking the speakers, um, the workshop leaders, to actually to do double duty. We're trying to capture their presentations and. Uh, create it and deliver it in a format that's, uh, um, you know, that has freedom and ease and flows well for you, but also uh, to ask them all to come back in November. And I'm just, I'm so humbled that uh, with, the, you know, the generosity of our speakers and, and our planning team, because um, nobody's getting paid here. <laughs> The, um, and yet we're, we have lots of, um, we have lots of expenses uh, around putting the conference on and, and all that that have to be taken care of. Um, what else I was going to say? Oh, and you know what? Another thing that's good is by November, they'll have, we will have the presidential election. There's a lot of water that's already going to go under the bridge by November. So there'll actually be some interesting developments, I think, in the conference that have in November versus the one that's presented in a few weeks on in April. So. And, and uh, I, just to, you know, reinforce for those listening, operationally, your conference planning team has been absolutely wonderful. I, uh, and I appreciate, you know, being uh, alerted to, you know, the conversations and the points that are being made. And I hadn't had the time to, participate as, as I would have uh, preferred to, but, but being aware of all everyone's heart and, and uh, mind and energy in working together uh, in, in, in making uh, this effort to, to become realized and valuable. I think all your listeners now, all those, uh, who should know about this conference will be most rewarded for all the work that has been, uh, you know, played out in, in, in making this happen and responding to changes in our, you know, in our society due to the coronavirus. Yeah, you know, the thing is, is we have a choice. And I, I tell people, you know, we, we're going to go through the same circumstances. 
um, you know, whether it's heavy traffic or it's whether it's isolation or whatever, but we do get a choice on how we're going to go through it. Uh, we can go through it with, with anxiety and fear and anger and all of those things, or we can uh, go through it and just stop, you know, part of it's the resistance of what's so that has us, you know, just, you know, just like, just like, uh, I hate to use an analogy of the flu, but, um, you know, when I've had the flu in the past, it makes it when I am resisting that, that those feelings and stuff like that, when it actually has worse impact, when I'm resisting the fact that uh, in child exchange and stuff like that, I'm resisting the fact that my ex is so aggravating. I'm actually making it worse on myself than to say, this is the way it is. And then, okay. And um, I'm going to have freedom and ease and peace, peace in the process. And it makes the attitude is everything. You know, the, the, um, um, the far East is known for, you know, martial arts, holistic complementary medicine, in ways of 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 uh, existing, and uh, there are several um, uh, I'm not sure what you might call them, but uh, for instance, uh, breathing techniques through Kijong, uh, if I say it correctly, uh, is something that I think we should all Google and search on YouTube for how to best breathe, how to best open our, uh, our chest and lung capacity, which not only will help us um, physiologically, but also help us mentally and, um, and build our resistance because it's our need for oxygen that is critical. And I'm reminding myself as I say this. Additionally, in terms of looking at energy, Tai Chi. Uh, tai Chi, I think it's in English, T-A-I, C-H-I. Uh, it is a way in which uh, what you said, uh, Danica, made me think, where you move with the energy that's addressed towards you. You don't resist it, but you either deflect or, 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 or you move to allow it to pass by you. And that came out of a martial art, which was a seemingly less aggressive form more of a dance-like approach to dealing with hostile forces. And Tai Chi actually is an exercise that is used uh, by many people, mostly in, uh, in, in the Far East, um, but it helps keep one young and in shape, but it's not, it's not meant to, to, uh, to kill or to harm. It's meant to allow you to take these negative energies and, and through movement, you will deflect them or otherwise absorb them without having the, uh, you know, the punishment that, that, that it is wanting to inflict on you. So I think we have a lot to learn it. As we have time, let's look at Qijong, which I think is Q-U-I-X-O-N-G, and Tai Chi, T-A-I-C-H-I. And I think that might help us create a new mindset for ourselves. I like that. I, I really do. I mean, I like it. It's uh, you're not going to create uh, by um, it, it's it's just that common thing. You can't um, be fight hate with with fit hate. You know, you you battle hate with love. Um, and yeah, um, and it would. I don't know where I was going with that, but it's true. It's true. You just, you, you take the force, the energy that you have available and just uh, use it and direct it uh, and don't react. I'm, I'm big on saying don't, you know, act, don't react. Mm -hmm. If you're reacting to something, you know, when something comes your way and you react, you're pushing it away. That is not the, the best thing to do. Like you said, is, is acting is seeing it coming and just letting it, go. I get that. And I think um, that's empowering also, right, Danica? It is. It is empowering because you're, you know, you're not at the effect. You're not the victim of the circumstance. You are, um, 
you know, there's, there's cause and effect. You can be, um, you can be at the cause of your circumstances. You don't have to be at the effect of your circumstances. Um, and I know there's a lot of deeper things underlying that statement to, to sometimes, because sometimes it's hard to wrap your head around it, but it is true. You can choose things. Uh, when I have taught anger management in the past, um, I tried to get the client to, to just own something. You know, because I get that when they go into court, a lot of times, you know, people, um, you, you end up on the short end of the stick. You're the one that ended up getting in jail. You're the one that ended up having to take DV classes or anger management classes and stuff like that. And you're just mad and you're like, it's, it, and then it's all about, um, <clears throat> it's not my fault. It's this person's fault. It's the judge's fault. It's this, da, da, da. like, okay, so that puts you in a position of being an, a victim of the circumstances, a victim of other people's choices and, um, uh, and judgments and stuff like that. But when you start really looking at what can I, what can I uh, claim, you know, what, I, what can I take responsible for? Like for instance, you know, um, I had a client where they were, um, it was really sad. It was really, really sad. Um, he was with his girlfriend and they were, they were living with her mom or her grandmother or whatever. And, um, things got really heated and the mom, um, threatened to throw his mother's ashes like on the ground. Not that she did it, but she threatened to, she threatened to because she knew she was poking the bear. She knew she was going to get a rise out of him. And if she did, then she wins. Uh, he ended up going into jail. He ended up in my class. And I was like, I hear your story and I'm really sad that this has all happened. However, how, we how do we shift you from being a victim of this situation to, um, to something much more empowering? And part of it was just trying to get him to, 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 to own up to anything. And I said, well, what can you, can you own up to the fact that you chose this relationship? Can you own up to the fact that you also chose, nobody dragged you kicking and street screaming into her mom's home to live. Can you choose that? Can you say that you powerfully chose to do that? Uh, the more you start claiming that, yep, I chose that. I chose that. I chose that. You, your power, you start getting your power back. You're no longer a victim. And it's the same in it. And sometimes it's really hard to see, um, especially when you're dealing with um, an alienator who's targeting you and just doing everything they can to squash you and destroy you. Um, it's important to say, well, let's see, what can I claim? What can I own that I chose? Even if it ended up badly, ended up being a bad choice. At least you can say I chose. It it uh, starts giving you a little bit more power, a little bit more power. Um, you know, I, I I oftentimes think of uh, what my uh, father frequently told me, and that is that you don't look backwards because life doesn't go that way. But if we can take, uh, so that was Sidney Roseman. You don't look backwards because life doesn't go that way. My father was a product of the depression, you know, a veteran of uh, World War II and, uh, and very anti-Semitism. So, you know, he's, he overcame a lot of stuff, but he said, don't look backward because life doesn't go that way. And, um, and, and, and I say that, uh, that we do, I, I totally agree with you. I think everybody would and does that, you know, so much in our life is based on our own uh, choosing. But we also should not take complete responsibility in that we don't know what other people's hot buttons are. We don't know what causes them to respond to certain things that we may say or that we may do. And, uh, and we can't take responsibility from that. We can learn from that and, and, and address, uh, uh, be more mindful uh, and, 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 and address less frequently the, uh, those hot buttons that others may have and which we ourselves, you know, respond to. And for many times we are just blind 
to our own hot buttons. But so we have to learn so much of uh, who we are and who those that we love or that are friends that we care about, who they are. Because we are all unique based on our circumstances, based on our heritage, based on our backgrounds, based on our life experience. Today, there's so much as, uh, that is uh, spoken of uh, with relation to ACEs, childhood traumas. That has been examined for more than 60 years. Childhood trauma is being addressed now is something that is a, is a greater universal. And what we should understand is that we are all products of our environment. And, uh, and I often will quote Carl Menninger, who uh, was one of the most forthcoming uh, forward thinking pioneers in child psychiatry. And he said, what children see at home, they will do to society. And I think that it, it, if there's any rule to live by, then that's that observation. What children see at home, they will do to society. Create the environment, help your child make choices, empower your child, help them learn about themselves as they develop, uh, have them become more conscious of what, what they are saying, what they are doing, understanding why, so that they can become much more empowered in, in their own behavior and in, in making even more magnanimous choices that are going to affect their lives and perhaps impact others. Uh, but they will learn from you. And so as a parent, as a grandparent, as an aunt and an uncle, you know, our extended family is so critical. And if we are blessed to have access to all of these members of such a family structure, from the parents, the bio parents, aunts and uncles, extended family, grandparents, uh, all of us who have those multiple roles should be mindful of how we relate to to these children, you know, in our family. That may not be our own children, but they may be our grandchildren, they may be our nieces and nephews, they may be, um, uh, you know, uh, related in, in other ways. Uh, we have responsibilities. You know, you pointed out, it's truly, you know, how they, how things happen in your home will end up bleeding over into society and how people, um, how, adult children end up dealing with their their spouses and their own children it's just and of course society as a whole <clears throat> i think that you know we all have um trauma from our childhood in some fashion it may be something where they got lost at the store you know and their parent couldn't find them for a couple hours you know that that can really be a trigger when you're a little seven-year-old or whatever. It made me think of an incident. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's like um, you, you can't, uh, you can look at these situations and you can say, okay, I recognize them. I see um, how it can, it impacts me. I can see how it impacts uh, my, my decisions and just being aware of it gives you the power to choose that or not that. Uh, and you've got, and being careful not to live in that what if world. Um, the what if world will have you um, accidentally making choices um, in the wrong direction. It, you know, it, it's whether it's, um, you know, the, the current state of affairs of, oh my gosh, what if this and what if that. Um, and then now you're like, Oh, like the toilet paper thing. Oh my gosh, what if? Oh my gosh, what if I don't have any access to the toilet paper? So I'm going to take it all. Next thing you know, the people who really need it are um, are impacted by your your what if fears. Um, and same thing with the children. A lot of times we we want to protect the children, and sometimes we want to overprotect them. Um, maybe even, and then that impact because maybe it is that you grew up in uh, abusive or neglectful environment growing up. So then when you become a parent, you're like, I do not ever want my children to experience what I went, what I went through. So I'm going to overprotect. I'm going to, you know, uh, I'm going to live in fear and overprotect and stuff like that. Next thing you know, the, re the, the impact on the children is, oh my God, I feel so suffocated. Stop. You know, like it, we have to be careful. We're not reacting and living in a what if world. Yes. 
Yes. And, and in fact, I, I love that phrase. I just wrote that down, Danica. I think it's, mm -hmm. uh, I, I think, I think that's a blog post you should write. Mm -hmm. uh, what if world, I think in, it's, uh, or the title of your next book. Uh, yeah. The what if, the what if world, I think that's really wonderful because, uh, it, you know, it, it's like, uh, you know, Franklin Roosevelt, pr former president, uh, wartime president from World War II period and, and, and helped bring this, this country out of the depression. He said that uh, there's nothing to fear but fear itself, if, if that's the correct quote. And, um, uh, and, and it's, he's really referring to the unknown. What, what we know, no matter how devastating, is it, it, it allows us to uh, have, have a reality that m indeed can be extremely frightening and foreboding, but we know what that foreboding is. You know, we know what is frightening. Uh, and, um, and oftentimes it's, uh, you know, we have experiences where we may uh, have a lot of fear, for instance, going to a doctor's office. Uh, if you remember as a kid and you're fearing getting a shot, maybe you don't get a shot, you find the doctor's office and says, I feel terrific, I didn't get a shot today. Uh, or you had a shot and he had you look the other way and he said it's done and you're waiting to feel it and you didn't feel the pinch. Uh, but there are other circumstances where we have fears based on what we think, not based on realities. And this is much of life, and it's, it, and it's very reasonable to be afraid of, of what we don't know. Absolutely. And if I think there's nothing more fearful. And in fact, that's what Roosevelt had said, Franklin Roosevelt. He said, uh, uh, what we have to fear is fear itself. And um, and so that means truth allows us to think of, okay, plan A, plan B, plan C. And we have to deal with realities. And, uh, you know, it's, it, 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 may, it, it may not take away our fright, but it gives us time to think, okay, so what should we do? And... Uh, uh, I, I think, you know, everything is about that kind of perspective. And, and it's not easy when you allow yourself to react, as you were saying earlier, and not to act. Yeah. Life becomes more difficult. Yeah, it really does. And um, you're focusing on what's going on over there instead of focusing on, on yourself and grounding yourself and... Um, in centering yourself in what's real, what's so, um, you know, what's so is I have a roof over my head. What's so is, you know, I have gas in my car. What's so is, you know, um, even the children, I don't have contact with the children right now. That's what's so. Um, and then you can start creating, but if you have Oh my God, I'm going to get kicked out of my house. Oh my God, I'm going to run out of gas. Oh my God, I'll never see my kids again. Um, one is disempowering. The other one, it builds things on a solid foundation of grounding. So, all right. So I, our time is wrapping up. I want to, uh, I'm super excited about you being one of our speakers at the Guardians and Gatekeepers Conference. That's okay. happening not once, but twice, uh, and two are going to be very uniquely different. This one is April 24th and 25th, and it's going to be uh, online. And so if you register for this event ahead of time, you get to go to two. You get two for one. You get to go to the online virtual conference, and then you get an invitation to our November, our live November conference happening in Lakeland, Florida. So. Um, yeah, I'm excited. I'm super excited about this. Thank you, Mark, for coming on the show. Thank you, Danica. Mm -hmm. and always, you have... a, always a pleasure, and it's uh, always a learning experience. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Uh, that, that does it for us on Custody Matters Live. We will see you again next Wednesday at 730 Eastern Standard Time. Have a great evening.